Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SAT and ACT presentation uh, being presented by Signet Education in Cambridge. Um, I'm welcoming both students from the British International School of Boston, as well as Nord Anglia's school in Houston, the Village School. I'm Ellen Boucher. I'm the Director of College Counseling uh, at the British International School of Boston. And I'd like to introduce uh, the owner and director of Signet Education based in Cambridge, Jay Bakrania. Hi, Ellen. Thank you. I'll take it away from here. So uh, thank you all so much for joining. And my goal today is to take a little history out of the SAT and ACT. Um, and so we'll have a presentation here that I believe will be about 35 to 45 minutes long, and we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. What I'd love if you could do is, uh, as we go through, we've done these presentations live um, for, for uh, Ellen's group for many years now, and it's usually typically an interactive event. But given that we're online, um, it's a little tougher to do that and keep the flow. So what I'd love for you to do is, as you get questions along the way, put them in the chat, and uh, we'll let them pile up. And at the end, I will definitely take um, some time to answer questions that apply to the group. Uh, and after the presentation, of course, we're always happy to um, chat and try to answer questions as well. So I'll start first with a little bit about us, uh, what, what we're up to here. So first, I want to give you a background on the SAT and the ACT. Uh, what are the tests? What's on them? Uh, why do we have them? Um, a little bit of context to then uh, dive into how to actually prepare. And so I'm going to talk you through the stages of preparation, exactly how to set up a prep plan uh, for your student. Um, and then also I'll describe a little bit of what we do at Signet at the end as well. Um, I like to share a little bit about Signet Education. Uh, we're a values-driven organization. We care deeply, we're on the ball, we inspire confidence and we teach students, not subjects. And we act as an academic partner to our families, helping to support and guide them through the entire high school process uh, with subject tutoring, test preparation, academic coaching. Um, and we take the approach that we really think about students as, as whole students and human beings. Uh, sure, we strive for results and we absolutely get them, but uh, we really try to think about what's in the best interest of the student and their education and partner with students and families to uh, to achieve their goals. So let's start with some background. What are the tests? Uh, sorry, a little typo there, I'm just noticing. Um, so what are these two tests? So what are the SAT and the ACT? Usually this is where we'll interact, but uh, I'll answer the question uh, here for you. They're two standardized admissions exams for American colleges. They cover some general material, which I'll describe to you in a moment. Um, and students have the option of taking them in 10th, 11th, or 12th grade as many times as they want, frankly. Um, and most colleges expect students to have a score on either one of these exams uh, to be uh, admissible to their college. There are plenty of colleges now that are going test optional, but the vast majority still either uh, expect you to have a score or having a score might benefit you in the process. And so, what are the role of standardized tests in college admissions? Uh, most colleges in the US uh, use a practice they call holistic admissions. So they're looking at a student holistically and looking at many different aspects of that student's candidacy to determine whether or not they should be admitted to their college or they might be a good candidate for their college. So they're looking at things like grades and test scores those are generally the two most important factors that most colleges consider, but almost all colleges are considering some combination of the rest of these uh, extracurricular activities or activities outside of school, uh, summer activities, financial need, uh, work or internships, um, teacher recommendations is a very important one. The personal essay and application that you actually submit as a student, uh, definitely IB scores uh, and AP scores if they're taken. Uh, legacy status, some colleges uh, uh, appreciate students who've had multiple family members go there. They give them a bit of preferential treatment. And then, of course, a personal interview. Again, not all of these are weighed the same in every college, 
But what we can say is that for the most part, grades and standardized test scores, specifically SAT and ACT scores, tend to be uh, pretty important in the US college process. So then the question comes up, why are there two tests? Well, I'll give you a quick history lesson um, here as it, as, it, as it gives us some context. There are two tests because uh, one of the tests was developed in the early 1900s and the 1920s. And that test uh, was developed by, it was actually commissioned by the president of Harvard at the time. And he wanted to develop an exam that would help him uh, cast a wider net and bring more students in than the traditional uh, prep school funnels that he had. And so he worked with a gentleman named Car Carl Brigham to develop an exam that was an aptitude exam. The idea was they're going to try to measure the horsepower. Uh, how intelligent were you? How much aptitude did you have uh, to learn? How much potential did you have? And so the result was that you got a, a test, the SAT, that has this history of being like an IQ test or kind of feels like a brain teaser test, uh, a little bit more complex, a very high emphasis on vocabulary previously. That's changed a little bit. Then in the 50s, there was a gentleman in the Midwest who said, I don't think that's the right way to approach testing. I think students should actually just be tested on what did they learn, what they needed to learn in school curriculum. So in a way, almost similar to uh, the IB examination, a little less uh, complex, a little bit more straightforward, multiple choice type tests. So you end up with these two tests that actually had geographical uh, differences. So most people in the Midwest um, took the ACT, and most people applying to schools on the coasts of the US took the SAT. And so for many years, probably until the mid 2000s, uh, many schools had a preference. So if you were in the Midwest, you'd have a preference for the ACT. If you were on the coast, you had a preference for the ACT or for the SAT. And since many of the popular schools that kids were applying to were on the, more kids tended to take the SAT. But in 2012, we see that the SAT, ACT actually took over in terms of prominence. And right now the tests are evening out to some degree. Uh, but the reason for this is because colleges began accepting tests uh, from any, uh, basically from either of those two tests. And the reason is that co competition for application and admission to college has gone up so much on account of the internet and applications being able to be submitted online, that colleges are now battling for students. And so they're saying, well, I don't want to disqualify a student from the Midwest who actually could uh, be a great fit for our school just because they took this test that we didn't prefer. So now we'll accept both tests. They have a lot of similarities and the competition over the years has actually caused both test makers to make changes that end up making the tests relatively similar. So in summary, we've got these two tests run by these two private organizations. They're considered nonprofits, but they make a heck of a lot of money for being nonprofits. And colleges have a tradition of using these exams as entrance exams. It's important to note that these companies are not run by the colleges. They're not run by the government. Uh, they're just private companies that administer these tests. And there's pretty much a norm or an expectation that most students in the US will take one of these tests. So what's on the tests? So as you can see here, uh, the tests are generally similar in length, uh, three hours and 50 minutes versus three hours and 35 minutes. The tests cover, both tests cover reading, uh, grammar, which is called writing and language on the SAT, math, and uh, science. ACT covers science, and I'll explain to you in a moment how the SAT covers that. And generally, in terms of both tests, the, the level of understanding that they're testing is not super complex. Uh, this is a test designed to be administered to uh, 11th graders across the nation. And the idea is that if you've gone through most curricula in most schools, you would have mastered most of the material that's going to be on these tests. So for example, in the reading section, uh, both uh, tests have passages that have 
reading comprehension questions that range in scope. So some about the whole passage, some about line items. And there is some difference though. So the SAT has this history of being this more IQ test. And while that's changed a lot, the SAT still feels a little bit more wordy and a little bit more complex when it comes to the reading. The reading level is also slightly higher. The average reading level on the SAT is about a grade level higher than the average reading level on the ACT. You can also see that there's a lot more reading on the SAT than there is on the ACT just in terms of that specific section. I'm going to explain some of these differences to you and then I'm going to summarize and generalize at the end. The writing language uh, on the SAT and the English on the ACT are very similar. They're grammar sections and they're not testing all of English grammar. They're just giving you a passage and they're underlining a portion and saying what would be, what would you change to make this uh, better? So sometimes it's commas, sometimes it's uh, uh, conjunctions, um, things that most students would have learned by this point, but generally they don't actually uh, have the language for. So when we're teaching students, we're just giving them the names of the exact uh, grammar types of questions that they're, uh, they're, that they're being tested on, and we help them see and identify those patterns well ahead of time. The two sections across both tests are remarkably similar. Uh, the math sections on the two tests test the same content. So algebra, uh, arithmetic, uh, algebra, geometry, and a little bit of trigonometry. But the, the, the look of the questions and the feel of them is very different. So on the SAT, a lot more word problems, uh, more complex reasoning and jumps, uh, more kind of acrobatics is what I like to call it. Uh, but on the ACT, uh, it's a little bit more straightforward. You see problems in kind of a straightforward manner. It's, cer it's certainly challenging in, in many places, but there's not as much, there's not as many words in the math section. There's not, not as much acrobatics. The ACT has a science section and it's not really science. It's really, you could call it maybe technical reading. Uh, you get presented with a passage that has some uh, a kind of a summary of an experiment or some data or a table, and you're asked to answer several questions based on that. We find that students who do well in the reading section actually very often have the potential to do well in the science section, even if they don't love science as a, as a subject, though that definitely helps. Interestingly, the SAT doesn't have a separate science section, right? Some people say, well, I'm going to take the SAT because I don't like science. It doesn't have a separate science section, but actually the same types of problems are sprinkled throughout the entire test. So uh, in the reading, even in the writing, the language, the grammar section, and the math section, you have these kinds of charts, graphs, data analysis type problems. But finally, there's an optional essay for both exams. And that essay is truly optional, depending on where you're applying to school. Many schools say they won't regard the essay, they don't need it, they truly don't want to look at it. Um, many schools say it's not really a good predictor for us of anything, so we don't care. Uh, but some schools say we absolutely want to see that essay. So before a student signs up, they need to know generally where, where they're applying or to which kinds of schools they're applying in order to make an informed decision on whether or not to prepare for and take the essay. So now, that's the description of the test. The biggest difference between the two, by and large, is actually timing. Uh, so the SAT actually asks you to do fewer questions in the amount of time that's available, and the ACT actually asks you to do more questions. So the content is similar, the thought processes and preparation is generally similar, but students tend to favor one test over the other just because of that timing and the different kind of presentation or, or flavor of the problems. I'm going to explain a little bit more about how a student might decide between these two tests. But just to summarize to, to this point, we have two college admissions exams uh, in the United States that are, you can take one or the other for admission to most colleges. And those exams cover reading, grammar, math, um, some science or data analysis, uh, and have an optional essay. They're similar in terms of the content that they test, but they're different in terms of the feel of that content and the pace that they test it at. So how are the tests scored? The SAT is scored on a 1600 point scale um, with, the, with the essay being separate. Uh, 800 points for math and 800 points uh, combined for the, the verbal reasoning is what they call it, which is the grammar and the reading section together. 
The ACT is scored on a 36 point scale. Uh, each of their subtests is scored on a 36 point scale. Uh, the, the reading, the grammar, the science and the math, and that's average to get you your score. Uh, back many years ago, the two testing companies realized that they needed to cooperate to a certain degree to create what we call con concordance tables. So you can say that, you know, a 36 on the ACT equals a 1600 on the SAT and all the way down. And so colleges use these and they're publicly uh, available. So when you're preparing, you can get a better sense. You can get a sense of how do I score on one versus the other and choose which exam might be the best for you. And colleges can compare relatively apples to apples uh, when two students come in, one with an ACT and one with an SAT. Finally, uh, about scoring, there's a thing that, that happens called super scoring. Um, super scoring means that if you take multiple tests on multiple days, which is very possible, uh, our students typically take two exams at the least, sometimes three, and I'll explain more about how you decide to do that in a little while. Uh, you can actually cherry pick across those testing dates which section scores you want to take. So for example, if you got a 600 on math on one test and a 700 on the other test, then you could choose that 700 uh, to, be, to be basically, the colleges will do that. They'll choose the 700. They'll choose your highest score amongst those sections uh, when you submit multiple test scores together. And the reason for that is they say they understand they know students have a bad day. Uh, they understand that sometimes a student just you know, didn't get something right and they want to present uh, they want to take their best view of that student, the most competitive view of that student. It also benefits them too because colleges report out their average scores uh, to ranking uh, uh, companies um, and for other reasons. Uh, and, and the higher that average score, the better the college looks. So it's in their best interest too to, to take that super score. So what that means is you can take the test over multiple days and if you score a little bit differently, you'll get the highest version of that score across the board. So that's a very high level look at the tests. Uh, when we used to do this presentation, we used to uh, explain what's in each section and show practice problems, but I saw enough eyes glaze over that uh, that's not really a great way to approach it for us. Of course, if you have more questions afterwards, um, we can answer them, or we actually have a great guide that goes into some depth on each of these sections that we're happy to send you if you send us an email afterwards. So next, how do we actually prepare for these exams? So before we start out, uh, there's no tips or tricks, there's no shortcuts to preparing for these exams. These are exams that test content that you were supposed to have learned. And so in order to actually uh, do well in these exams, you have to practice. I actually compare it, it's more, doing well in these exams is a little bit more like a doing well in a sports endeavor or a musical performance. It's a performance. You've got to get used to the patterns. You've got to get used to what's on there. You've got to practice it. You've got to get used to the time. You've got to build up the stamina for the entire test. So there's a lot of effort involved in students improving. So before I dive into anything about how to prepare, I like to put this out there. This is a very general chart. Uh, absolutely does not apply to every student. Um, it's very much kind of average from our experience. Some students do, uh, do perform more quickly and less quickly, but at least it gives us a baseline. So if you're looking for, our general um, student is looking for somewhere in the 100 to 150 point range, so that third bullet point down um, on the SAT or three or four points on the ACT. It's about 40 or 50 hours of work. That's not 40 or 50 hours of tutoring. Um, that might be four or five hours per week of, of prep work over the course of, say, 10 weeks, or you could even stretch it out longer. And that's a good solid starting point and a good solid expectation in terms of score increase. I'll explain to you how to determine your score increase and what, uh, what score ranges are valuable for what colleges in a moment. But just bear with me for a second and take on faith that that's usually a very solid score increase and usually what puts um, students at the British school into a really good place in terms of their uh, application competitiveness. So let me start with the timelines. So our general timeline for students in terms of when we recommend them to prepare is at the end of sophomore year or 10th grade year, 
uh, students should take a diagnostic test or they might have a PSAT that they can use as a diagnostic. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, take a diagnostic test and make a test prep plan. Some of those students might prepare over summer if they know their fall and junior year is going to be uh, very busy, or if they have a really aggressive uh, goal, they wanna, they wanna really push themselves and they need more time to prepare, or they say, hey, I've got downtime, I wanna get started, I, I'd like to get a jump on this. Some students prepare in the summer of sophomore year and we generally advise that. Um, other students, however, say, I'm not preparing over sophomore year, but I've got a plan. I know I need, a, let's say, a 100 point increase uh, to reach my goals and I'm going to start in fall of junior year. We generally recommend students begin preparation then at the latest and they prep uh, assiduously, uh, throw in an SAT word there for you, um, and we generally recommend that they take their first test in the late fall, uh, early winter stage, and we generally recommend a second test in later spring, um, early or later spring. All of this depends on the specific student, but this is kind of the starting point that we recommend. So this can also be altered if you're a junior on this call or a family of a junior, then you should understand that this is a very different timeline you'll be dealing with, and especially in light of what's going on with COVID, uh, you, you, the, there are many test dates that are actually canceled. So you will be testing in the fall of your senior year, which increases the stakes a bit because you don't have as many possibilities for taking the exam because uh, college applications are right around the corner after that starts. Um, if we have more questions, uh, or if we have more uh, juniors or 11th grade families in the call, I can answer more questions about how COVID uh, impacts what we're doing and what's happening in the space uh, in the question and answer afterwards. But again, general timeline, end of sophomore year, before brain turns off for summer, uh, take a diagnostic, or even, even during school at the end of school, um, sometimes we've administered that at, at the British School in Boston. Um, I'm clearly probably not going to do that this year, though we could do it virtually. Um, we provide these uh, tests for free for, for our British School partners uh, virtually, and we'll provide a test score report and everything for free. So we can do that for you at the end of sophomore year, or if, if you use our guide, you can learn how to do that yourself. Uh, summer of sophomore year, some students prepare fall of junior year, really start prepping, and you're planning for two tests uh, by the end of junior year with a possible third in the summer or in the uh, fall of senior year. So here's the process outline. Here's how we actually dive in. We first pick a test to focus on, the SAT or ACT. Then we define what a goal score would be, an ideal score to shoot for. We don't wanna just prepare and have everybody try to shoot for a perfect score. Uh, you don't need that, and it's, it's not worth spending an extra minute of time on test prep that you don't have to. Uh, you should pick a couple of test dates to know exactly, generally, what your plan is going to look like. Make a test prep plan, and then practice and refine and work that plan. And so this is what we do with our students. Uh, we do all of this. We help from start to finish. But even if you weren't working with a tutor, this is a process that you should consider using yourself. And so I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into each of these now. So first, you want to pick a test. So what you do is you want to do a diagnostic. So we generally recommend doing a full-length exam of the SAT and a full-length exam of the ACT at home as a practice test. You don't need to go to the testing center or pay any money for that. Do it at home. There are official materials available uh, on the, the College Board and ACT website, the SAT and ACT website. Um, again, our guide describes exactly how to do this. And so you want to take those two full length exams and then compare them. Uh, now, if you have a PSAT exam, which some of you may, but most of you likely don't, um, you can use that in place of the SAT. That's a PSAT that's offered in schools. Uh, but otherwise, take those full length exams. Some students, if they really don't want to take it, if it's really painful, there are kind of ways that we can work around that with a tutor. But typically, we recommend to do that. That gets your head in the right place as a student. You understand what to expect. You get a sense of what's on the exams, and you get a really good feel for them. Next, you want to look at the quantitative and qualitative uh, results. So quantitative meaning, which one did you do better on? So about 50% of our students do better on one or the other exam. About 25% do significantly better on one or the other exam. For those students who are doing generally in the same uh, range for both exams, 
you want to consider the qualitative aspects, meaning did they enjoy a test, or enjoy is probably a strong word, but did they find one test more tolerable than another? Um, many students will take both tests, score about the same and say, that one felt really hard and this one didn't feel so hard. So you wanna look for which test is actually going to be easier to improve on in the future. And then finally, you wanna pick a test and stick to it. You don't need to submit two tests. There's absolutely no value in it. Um, it's just a waste of your time, effort, energy, and money. And if you try to prepare for both, even though there's a lot of overlap and they're very similar, you're going to end up wasting uh, time and energy and effort. So we get some kind of the overachiever type student at times saying, well, I'm going to just I'm gonna do the other one. I'm going to do one. I'm going to do the other one. I'm going to submit them both. The college will know I'm amazing. And we say, spend that time doing something else uh, that's important to you that will show the college that you're amazing focus on one test, prepare. Every once in a while, we'll get some students who prepare for say three or four months, and then they hit a wall. And then we realize uh, through understanding exactly the patterns that are showing up in their testing, maybe it's time to consider the other test. But by and large, that's about 10% of people. By and large, do the diagnostic process, pick one, go with it. Next, you wanna define an initial goal score. And so, there are a couple of factors to consider. And the first one is what college goals does your student have? Now, I know many students in the British school are thinking about uh, applying to school in America, but also thinking about applying to school in the UK or abroad. And so this is kind of a complex discussion and calculation, and you definitely need to work with Ellen or the director in Houston, uh, whoever is in charge at your school of college counseling, to really think through this carefully. But as a very general way of approaching this, uh, I'll show you this very basic chart also in our guide as well. And this is very rough based on data from a large survey by a company called Barron's a Media Company. And for the SAT, um, which is what we have here, uh, just as an example, you're looking at a score of about 700 or above to be in the rankings for the most competitive schools. I know a lot of students at the British school are saying, well, I, you know, I don't want to go to school in the US unless I'm going to a really great school. Um, and so that's kind of a really, that's the top range that you're shooting for. But 650 and above really opens up a lot of great possibilities for you. Um, that's generally where we're seeing most of our students aim for is in the mid to high 600s or above. Most students are starting in the mid to high 500s. And so they're looking at that 100 to 200 point increase across both sections. So you want to consider your college goals. Before you start test prep, you want to say, well, where am I thinking about going to college? Even if I don't know, what kinds of colleges are appealing to me? And based on that, what's a general score range that I kind of need to get into? The way we do that is you actually look up the college and you look at what their average middle 50% SAT scores are. They publish that. Um, and then you uh, use that to basically say, look, I, th that's my approximate target. And so, uh, again, Ellen or a college uh, counselor can help you uh, do this process effectively, thinking about different types of colleges. But that's a good place to start in thinking about your goals. Next, you also want to think about your diagnostic starting point. So if your starting scores come back in the 500s for each section, so you've got a total of 1,000 points, and you really want to shoot for something in this, the 1400, that's a 400 point increase. That's a lot. If, if you remember the chart that I showed you earlier, that's at least 75 or 100 hours of preparation. Not saying you can't do it. We've seen students come in from lower than that to going higher than that. It happens, but it just requires a commitment. And that brings us to the next factor, which is what kind of motivation do you have? So when you're setting that goal score and thinking about how much you want to increase, you really have to think about how motivated am I to move this score up? How much time do I want to put in? How much time do I have? Uh, what kinds of uh, uh, time in my week am I willing to devote to this? Um, am I willing to do this over the course of six to eight months or do I want to get this done in a month? So it's really important to be honest about this uh, right from the start, because if you're not, it just leads to a lot of pain. Next, you want to pick a test date or three. So generally speaking, uh, the tests, uh, ACT is administered in June, 
July, and then we skip August, we go to September, October, and then we skip a couple months, but it's almost monthly. Uh, and the SAT is the same, but just a little bit off of that schedule. At this point, as sophomores, you should be considering uh, times in, in the range of uh, late uh, fall, winter, early winter, early spring um, on both of these. So you've already chosen a test that you're going to, to, to take, and then you choose the test date based on that. For juniors, uh, 11th graders on the current call, you should be preparing now, but there's a lot of uncertainty in which tests are going to be available. So as of now, uh, the, the SAT is canceled May and June. We believe the ACT is going to cancel June uh, imminently. Um, no schools are going to be open or not very many will be open to administer the exam. And so possibly there might be an ACT in July um, and in fall, both test companies have said, if we can't test widely, then we will be administering online at home tests. We have no idea how that's gonna work. Uh, the SAT especially has had major problems with security and security breaches um, with their tests. We don't know how they're going to administer online, but that's what they claim they're going to do if tests are not widely available. We also believe that since many tests are being skipped now, that there will be more test dates offered in the fall by both companies, uh, possibly even up to every weekend, uh, but we don't know. And so because of that, we recommend students to, to expect to start testing no later than September uh, juniors, but to anticipate that it might be very difficult to get a spot. And so uh, it's important to prepare now, be ready or prepare over summer and be ready and make sure that as soon as registration opens up, students are signing up for a spot as, as soon as possible. So we've chosen a test, we've defined the goal score, we've picked a date, we have general sense of this is or a couple of dates, this is when we want to, to, to actually uh, test. By the way, picking that date also depends a little bit on your goal. If, you're, if your test score increases like you know 50 points, uh, relatively modest, then you can choose a date that's sooner. Uh, if your test score increase is very high, then you definitely want to choose a date that gives you more time to prepare. So the next thing is to actually create a plan. And so this, I'm just going to talk you through a, at a very high level how we think about uh, test prep planning. So you choose a test, you have your starting score, you have your goal score, you have your date, you think about the test date, and then you really want to think about when am I actually going to do this? What time do I have available? Is it a specific time once a week? Is it uh, on the weekends? Um, when am I going to create that time in my schedule? How much time do I have available to actually create a plan? And a good plan has phases and milestones. So first you start with generally learning and understanding the material, meaning every test is going to have, each test, unless you're really advanced, each test is going to have a few things that you don't remember or you haven't learned or you need to brush up on. What we found is for students in the IB curriculum, they actually have a very strong grasp of almost all of the material, but the material has been presented to them in the past in their schooling in a very different way than it's presented on the exam. So it's not that they have to learn the material uh, in, in sort of from the ground up, but it's that they have to translate the way that they understand the material to the way that the material is presented on these exams. So you learn the material, you understand it, you do very basic drills with it, you learn the grammar rules, you learn the math concepts, you practice with the formulas, then you practice in context. So what this means is you're really working on practice sections or practice problems from the exam. Now the exams actually are a little tricky, right? They take this basic information and they have to make it hard, otherwise they wouldn't be very good tests. And so the way they make it hard is they, they put time pressure on you, they mix problems, um, concepts in ways that you probably wouldn't see on your exams in class. Uh, they turn things upside down and ask you to find different types of information before you can solve the problem. And so it's all about patterns. These are standardized tests. They, there is a method to the madness. So you have to practice in that context to get those patterns down. And then finally, you want to focus on mastering the test. So this is like, uh, you know, you're trying to cook uh, let's say you're, you're a caterer and this is your first wedding that you're ever going to cater. Kind of weird analogy. Maybe I'm hungry, uh, but go with me on it. First wedding you're ever going to cater. And 
So first you try to cook every single dish separately and perfect those dishes and make sure you understand each dish. But if you don't actually produce the whole thing as a test run or you don't have the experience of doing that, then that wedding is going to be a disaster. And we see this all the time with students who come to us. Um, they might have tried prepping on their own before. They've practiced a bunch. They've done a bunch of different types of practice problems, but they never actually sat down and did the entire test um, and did it multiple times to understand what kind of stamina they need to, to, to be able to perform at their best. So some questions to consider when you're developing a prep plan. What sections are you going to cover by when? We generally don't recommend studying for the whole test at one time. We recommend breaking it down studying for each section and then kind of layering new sections on. Um, when are you going to do practice tests? So practice testing is one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, a test prep uh, plan or program or curriculum uh, because it really allows you to understand whether you're making progress and to kind of put those pieces together. There's actually some anecdotal data uh, from other companies in the space that we're familiar with uh, that say that actually if you just do the more practice tests you do the more your score will increase there's some nuance to that it's not just about doing practice tests you've got to be deliberate in your approach and i'll explain a little bit about that uh, in a moment um, but uh, it's really important that you schedule those practice tests we generally recommend once a month full length practice tests until your exam uh, though again a lot of nuance in that for every single person how much time per week will you devote when will you ask for help so this is a big one. A lot of students, they start studying and then they just kind of hit a wall and they keep hitting that wall again and again and again and again. And they don't realize that somebody um, could probably help them solve their problem much more quickly. And so who are you going to ask for help? A teacher, a sibling, another student who's taken it, a tutor. What we found is that students who are working with somebody, namely for us, a tutor, uh, it's not that students not working with somebody can't do really well and make great progress. It's just that a tutor typically helps that progress go a lot more quickly. And so who will you ask for help? Knowing who to ask for help will help accelerate that, that, that uh, test prep process. How will you know if you're ready? So are you taking enough practice exams? When are you going to take a practice exam? And how will you know when you're close to your goal score? And then finally, if you have accommodations, meaning if you have some kind of learning difference and you apply for those accommodations, um, and, and receive them. Uh, namely, most of the students that get accommodations are generally getting an extended time. How are you going to practice with that accommodation so that, again, when you go in on test day, uh, you're really ready to rock and you're, you've thought about the whole thing, you've practiced the whole thing. It's not your first time sitting in that room for time and a half. So a couple of uh, updates or, or COVID-19 impacts that, that I've mentioned before, but that I'll talk about here. Uh, we have had test cancellations. Um, many colleges are actually issuing some kind of guidance in terms of <clears throat> that they might be changing their policies this fall. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even though a lot of folks in the media are saying, well, you know, this means that schools are going to go test optional. Uh, students don't have to worry about tests as much. And even though a lot of students might see this and say, well, the school that I want to go to said they don't require the test anymore, so I'm off the hook. We actually find that uh, we believe that there may be uh, as much of a benefit or more to presenting a strong test score. And we've heard from several universities, uh, Dartmouth, uh, UT Austin, UCLA, that uh, they will not be able to operate admissions without test scores. Um, and so a lot of schools are saying, no, we still need them. As long as you can take a test before October is what Dartmouth says, we're going to require a test. Um, but it's just really important to remember that a lot of schools, uh, high schools are going uh, grade uh, like pass fail on their grades or their grading standards have been understandably reduced or through this COVID uh, time. A lot of students are not going to have the same level of extracurricular involvement that they had before. Um, and so you have less, if you think about the chart that I showed you at the beginning of all the different things that colleges use to evaluate a student, fewer of those things are actually going to be as reliable. And so we believe that the test may actually help a student distinguish themselves if they do a good, if they're able to perform well in those tests. So we don't recommend, we recommend right now for students who are in their junior year, you can actually take it a little bit slower because you're 
first potential test date is not until September, October, but we don't recommend actually changing course and saying, I'm not gonna take the test, unless you've gone over that with Ellen uh, or, or college counselor to understand and make sure that that's really what's in your best interest. So don't take your foot off the gas until and unless you do that proper analysis to make sure that's in your best interest. I mentioned earlier that both uh, exams say, say that they will have online tests if in-person testing is not available. Our recommendation for 10th graders and below, follow everything I said uh, without any regard to COVID. For 11th graders, uh, you kind of have to watch, wait and see, but continue to stay focused on the prep. So overall, generally at this point, stay the course. A little quick uh, note on accommodations. So accommodations are relatively blunt, but there are a few. So what I mean by that is um, there's extra time that's given for students that have learning differences and that require it. Um, some students can be given private testing uh, or a scribe or larger font if students have eye issues. So lots of different accommodations. These accommodations are given if you have a history of a documented learning difference. Uh, Generally, it should be documented by some kind of uh, psychological professional, and those should be administered. Those those learning uh, those accommodations should be administered in your current school context. Uh, so, if you have that, you should definitely uh, look into applying for those uh, through the school. Um, if your student has accommodations, they need an individualized plan to approach this exam. Sitting through a time and a half test is brutal. And so you definitely need to practice with that. You need to plan around that. You need to have a strategy for dealing with that. It's kind of funny. A lot of students who have ADHD get extra time. But if you think about taking a student with ADHD and locking them in a room for five hours uh, with a pencil and a sheet of paper, you kind of wonder how it all works out. Um, an outside perspective on this can reduce the pain, uh, meaning it can help with the strategy and just sort of the pain of that preparation. And sometimes the stigma that goes along with that learning difference can, sometimes that learning difference can make preparing for standardized tests difficult. And so an outside perspective uh, from a coach or tutor can help. You have to ask, and this is really for any student, is, is that once you hit a plateau, you can improve, but it's going to come at a cost, meaning a cost of time, effort, stress, energy, and an opportunity cost, meaning you don't have the time to focus on other things. So you have to ask yourself through this process, is the cost of doing well worth it? Again, this is for everyone, but especially for students with learning differences. If you're going to apply, apply early through your school's coordinator, very important. Finally, uh, how Signet works with students. Uh, this is how we support students through the process. So essentially what I gave you was a very high level version of our playbook. We take that and we make a personalized and individualized plan for every student helping them from before their diagnostic, sometimes even helping parents uh, figure out how to talk to their student about starting this, um, all the way through uh, that last test. Um, do I retest? Is my score where I could get it? What test date should I shoot for? All those questions we help with. We do this through one-on-one -on -one instruction with incredible mentors. Um, we are, we've spent 15 years trying to perfect how we find, select, train, mentor, and manage our mentors. Um, and again, we work from beginning to end. Uh, we're really focused on the student. We want the stu this to be the student's process. And by and large, uh, when students are working with us, they do on the process. So for parents, it's like, you know, you basically get the updates and you give input where, where you feel is appropriate, but it's not, there's no battles for you to have to fight. So we take care of that from beginning to end with the student and keep the parent involved and updated as appropriate. We take a team approach. So if our tutor is hitting a, a kind of a, a challenge with a student that they are feeling like, oh, I, I don't fully understand this, they're supervised very closely internally uh, and they work on teams. So they are constantly sharing and improving uh, their craft together. And again, our goal with students is less time on prep, more time for life and for everything else. So our goal is to get students in and out as quickly as possible um, to hit the goals that they have. And that's it, um, short and sweet. Uh, I would love to take questions. You can put them in the chat, or uh, if you feel comfortable, you can um, unmute yourself and ask the question, but probably putting them in the chat might be a little bit better if, if we have a lot of them and I can work through them. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's the presentation. Uh, Ellen, if you have anything to add, um, if I've missed anything, or if you'd like me to cover anything, anything specific, uh, please please let us know. Otherwise, we can wait for some questions here in the chat, and I'd be happy to field anything and everything. Thanks, Jay. As always, that was amazing. Um, let's see if we have some questions. I always seek to give a perfect presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if that one was, but the no questions is making me feel like it maybe was. Okay, how long are the scores valid for? Yes, good. All right, so how long are the scores valid for? Um, so it's a good question. Uh, generally speaking, the scores are valid for about five years. Um, that information is from a few years ago, which was the last time I checked this. Most students don't actually have a problem because generally they're taking in sophomore or junior year and then applying to college either the year after or perhaps even after a gap year and, and they're still valid. Um, so generally speaking, it's about five years uh, that they're valid. Next question, uh, where can we take the diagnostic exams? So at this point, uh, previously for those in Boston, you could come to our center and do the diagnostic exam in a real test testing environment. But at this point, um, we're doing what we've done for a lot of students is we'll send you an exam, uh, we'll send you instructions, and uh, we'll either ask you to take the exam and proctor yourself, or we can even uh, proctor the exam for you via Zoom where somebody sits here and does the timing and uh, uh, gives you kind of the general feel for how a proctored exam would go. Um, so those exams are delivered in person when we're back to not being so distanced or online uh, or self-administered. And for uh, British school students, uh, that's free uh, for you all. So uh, that's through our partnership we've had for many years. Uh, we do the exam and then after the exam, uh, we'll give you a report and analysis, uh, two reports that show you exactly how you did and how you stack up on both exams really in depth, gives you a lot to study based on. And uh, we'll do a free call with you to walk you through those reports. Um, as Ellen will uh, mention um, uh, to you, or, or, or could I think vouch, hopefully Ellen, if I'm not speaking out of turn here, uh, we're very focused on just helping students do the best they can. And for some students, that means they do the exams and we say, you don't need tutoring, you're at your goal score. Or look, 50 points, you're highly motivated, do these four things and take a, take a practice exam, call us if you need it afterwards. So we're very much focused on really trying to help first and helping students first through that process. It's not a timeshare sales style uh, process. Um, is the presentation recorded? And if so, will we be able to access it? Yes, it is. And I have to talk to my team as to exactly how that's going to work. Uh, but we'll be following up um, with Ellen uh, with an email with those details, um, and you will be able to access it. Uh, will one-on-one -on -one instruction be virtual for the time being? Yes, um, we've actually been doing one-on-one -on -one instruction virtually uh, for years now, I think at least eight, seven or eight years. Um, and about 40% of the work that we do in our company is actually done online uh, prior to, to, to coronavirus, and now 100% of it is done online. Um, so we've, we've got great ways to make the preparation extremely effective. Uh, we use an online platform that has a whiteboard. Uh, it's very easy. There's not, it, it's actually uh, has its own built-in kind of troubleshooting and tech support. So it's not a lot of jumping through hoops. We upload our curriculum on there. We mark it up with the students. The students can download those PDFs and the board. They can upload their homework. Super seamless, uh, works really well. And that's the way we do a lot of instruction. In fact, some of our families, even though they're local, they prefer that because it's just a lot more convenient for students. Are subject tests still required by the Ivy Leagues? Also, does the ACT have any subject tests? So quick uh, primer here. So the SAT offered uh, uh, or offers what it calls SAT subject tests. Those are one hour, shorter, very content fo focused exams. So a SAT subject test in chemistry would feel very much like a year-end chemistry test in a advanced high school chemistry course. Uh, whether or not, so those tests have been slowly going out of fashion over the last several years. There are definitely still schools that require uh, those subject tests. And the best way to figure out which ones it is, because that list is, is dynamic, just Google. Uh, there's a bunch of um, uh, uh, companies that have put together a list of exactly which schools are requiring what subject tests. But over time, those are going out of fashion. That said, for students in the COVID era, 
who may not be getting standardized test results. I don't think that's you all because you do have your predicted IB scores. Um, those can sometimes be a way to kind of show competence in a particular area. And does the ACT have any subject tests? The ACT does not have subject tests. So there's nothing like that from the ACT. It's just from the SAT. And it's really a different beast altogether than the, the, the SAT that I was discussing today. Can either uh, test provide an advantage based on what major you wish to take in university? That's a wonderful, uh, wonderful question. Um, no. Uh, those tests are, uh, the, both of the tests are general enough and cover the same content enough that they are accepted equally by both universities. And really, if you think about why, this is really a, the test is really used as a sorting and comparison mechanism. And colleges literally look at those uh, tests for like a, a second. Uh, if you look at the way a person reads an application, uh, they read through, they look at the test score, and literally you're within range, you're below range, you're above range, and that's it. And frankly, at that point, they sort you uh, mentally and they forget about it. Now, you know, it, it's a little bit more nuanced than that if you're on the line or if you've got a great candidacy, but you're a little bit below range. So it's not quite that cut and dried. But for many students, the admissions officer just says, oh, yeah, you're in the ballpark. Great, you can do the college level work, great. And they really don't care. It doesn't confer any advantage whatsoever because frankly, they want to be able to admit you if you're within the ballpark. So for a sophomore becoming a junior, planning to take the first exam in late spring 21, when would be the best time to start with Signet so that the learning is fresh by test time? That's a very good question. What I would recommend is, now, uh, I would wanna to talk to you a little bit more to understand the logic in picking the first exam in late spring. Um, because generally what I would recommend is, is that you actually do this, the process that we recommended, take that diagnostic exam, see how far you need to go. And then based on that, we can generally recommend how much time you should devote to preparation. And we might help you strategize in terms of what dates to choose based on, on your specific situation. That said, uh, if you are uh, going to uh, take it in spring, we generally recommend at least three months, uh, but definitely six months of, of preparation uh, is generally kind of a baseline, but it could be less or more uh, depending on where you start. Are there costs involved for your mentoring service? Uh, yes, there are. Um, uh, Chris, my colleague who's on this call, jokes that if I were in charge, we'd just give it all away for free but we are um, definitely a business and, and, and have a business to run. Our costs generally range from about $165 to $200 per hour. Um, and most students are looking at somewhere between 10 to 25 hours of preparation with us. Um, some families uh, for, for whom, for whom you know, that's totally affordable, others it's a bit of a stretch. The way I like to frame it is, you know, if you think about a college admissions uh, or college uh, tuition over the course of four years, it could be upwards of, you know, who knows at this point, but upwards of three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 to spend a few thousand dollars on test prep to ensure that you can essentially get into the college that you want to get into typically has very high returns relative to the investment you're about to make. Um, what's the maximum number of tests we recommend to take to improve the score and the number of tests after which it's not worth taking more for the score in, uh, for the score improvement? So that's a really good question. So there's two elements to that question. I'm going to take them separately. The first element is that uh, you generally don't want to be sitting for more than three official exams. So official exams means you're signing up, you're going to the test center, you're getting a score, uh, it's, a, it's the whole shebang, the whole to-do. And the reason for that is uh, twofold. Number one is if you, a lot of colleges ask you to send all your scores, though some colleges will allow you to send whatever scores you want. So sometimes this college will see how many times you took it, other times they won't. But if a college sees that you took the test more than three times, they start to say, why is this student so focused on this test? Why aren't they doing something more kind of interesting with their lives? And 
why is it that they had to keep taking that test multiple times and they haven't actually gotten that much improvement? So we generally recommend two or three times. That's one reason. The other reason is, is more kind of along the second aspect of this question that I'll answer is you really shouldn't have to take it more than two or three times if you're prepping uh, effectively. So what I mean is if you're prepping deliberately, if you're putting in the right time and the right effort and you've got a good prep plan with practice tests over time, and when something is not working out, you're troubleshooting and figuring out how to improve it, then you really shouldn't have to sit for more tests than that to get to your ideal goal score. And ideally, you're working with somebody who can help advise when to put those tests to get the kind of the most bang for your preparation buck. So in terms of another aspect of this question, which is how many practice tests, uh, we could actually reframe this and say, well, how many practice tests should you take? Well, there are a limited number of practice tests of the SAT that are available. There are tons of the ACT, though the ACT evolves and changes every year. So some of the older ones are a little bit less relevant. Um, most of those, AC, the SAT and ACT both release practice tests for free. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, practice tests for the ACT that are kind of not released. If you just Google, you'll find them. It's illegal technically to download them, so we don't recommend it, but they're out there. Um, in terms of uh, how many of those you should take, that's really a question of how you're practicing. So we definitely had students that come in and they take like, they're like, listen, I've taken 12 practice tests. My score hasn't improved. I was like, well, you've, you've spent uh, 12 different times spending four hours doing the same exact thing over and over. Uh, so, and you haven't actually reflected on it. So of course your test score hasn't improved. So in terms of practice tests, generally speaking, the more practice tests, the better, as long as you're doing the work in between to actually improve using those practice tests. If you're just churning through practice tests uh, without doing that reflection and that learning and that improvement, then you're not actually going to see the benefit that you could see. Uh, is the August SAT curved? Um, so you might be referencing a couple of different things. So I'll try to answer each of those. So first off, is the test itself curved? It's not really curved, so to speak, but it is normed. The test does a lot of statistical analysis, the SAT and ACT, to make sure that between tests, a five, 500 or a thousand point score on one test in sitting is truly equivalent to a thousand point score on another test sitting. So what you'll see is on, on the um, tests that are released or in the practice tests on the score keys, that sometimes you might get say 30 questions right in one section and that might equal a particular score, but on another test that equals a slightly lower or slightly higher score. And that's because of the analysis and, and, and norming that they do. Um, Another question is, is that might, you might be referring to is because of a particular time of the year, is a test going to basically, is a test going to be graded easier or harder because of the types of students that might be taking that test or the number of students that might be taking that test? And generally speaking, there's probably going to be variation at different types of the year. There's different patterns, but typically there's so many students taking these tests that uh, we don't really recommend trying to game at all when you're going to take the test in terms of the the way that they're going to be scoring those tests really their job is to to make sure that every single test is going to be consistent and the sat does have a lot of problems but you know that's their job and that's what we rely on them to do and that's what they generally do so we generally don't recommend it that said there have been some snafus in the past uh, year or two since the new uh, exam was released where certain dates just seem to have a really steep decline. You miss one question, you're down uh, 20, 30, 40 points on the SAT. There's no way to predict that. And so we generally recommend to prepare as well as, as effectively as possible and take the test that's appropriate for you at the right time. Do Ivy Leagues prefer the SAT over the ACT? Absolutely not. Um, the Ivy Leagues, just like every other college, are trying to get the most competitive applicants possible. And for those schools, they typically could fill their classes multiple times over with perfect scores. So what they're looking for for a score on these exams is that you're within range. You've shown on a standardized exam that you have the capability to do that level work uh, or high level work in a college. Uh, you have the capability to excel on this exam and that's it. The rest of your application is going to become far more important after you've cleared that hurdle. And really, either of those tells them that you're in the ballpark. 
both tests are very challenging. They're different, but they're challenging. And so if you do well on, on either one of them, you're showing the skill that's required to be, uh, well, so this is the sort of, uh, this is a basically an open question actually as to whether it actually uh, predicts college success. But you're showing colleges that you can do work at a certain level or perform at a certain level on the exam. And that's really all they care about for these tests, for the purposes of these tests. Do universities look at all the SAT scores from all exams that you've taken? Uh, in short, uh, no. You have the choice to send the scores that you uh, decide, but some universities do have a policy of asking you to send all of your standardized test uh, uh, information. Wherever you, uh, whenever you took standardized tests, whichever ones you took, they want to see all of that. So typically what we recommend is uh, you know, if you're taking two or three exams um, and you send them all in, generally that's to your benefit. Uh, colleges want to super score across those. There's probably not really a good reason to take more than that. So if you're taking more than that, you should call us and we'll discuss why um, and what to do about that specifically. So for most kids, even if you do have to release all of your scores, usually it's not a problem. Um, and in fact, can often work in your favor. And we generally recommend to strategize in a way that you're not having to take so many tests that you'd be embarrassed to share those. Now, for some students, uh, this might come up on SAT subject tests where they say, hey, I should take the subject test this year. I took this class. I did well. And they go and they take the subject test and it doesn't go so well. Um, and for colleges that are asking for all the test scores, sometimes that can be a little bit painful. So we definitely recommend planning and studying for those subject tests. If you're going to take them, uh, try to do as well as possible on them. That is the end of the question list for now. Any other questions? Great, Ellen, any uh, final words to, to close us out here? Um, Jay, just thank you so much for spending time with our families and students tonight to um, give them the overview and the timeline. We greatly appreciate it. Um, and I'll, I'll let families from both Boston and Houston know when I have the recorded version of this in case you want to review it. Great. Yeah, we'll send you the recorded version and we'll send you a, um, just if you're interested in doing a diagnostic, uh, exactly how to get in touch with us for that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll send you both of those things, Ellen, and you can forward those on to whoever's interested. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.